Chapter 13 Link grasped the wet stone with cold fingers, gritting his teeth as he struggled to maintain his grip on the stone. The rain had begun in earnest mid-climb, naturally, and he'd almost slipped several times. Next to him, the waterfall roared, falling a surprisingly far distance down to the ground below. He'd learned not long ago not to look down, however, and continued to climb, finding the small handholds that he was able to fit his fingers and feet into. Finally, his hand reached the top of the rock face, and a pair of red Zora hands clasped his own, helping him climb to the top. Once at the top, he sighed softly, nodding toward his companion, and looking up the remaining hill that led to the top of Ploymus Mountain. The Lionel that had been terrorizing the Zora would be there, likely waiting for its next challenger. Link wondered how many Zora had already perished because of the terrible beast. Link, are you sure about this? said his companion. He turned and looked at the slender Zora, meeting her eyes. He appreciated that Mipha was here. She had certainly helped him climbing up a few of the more difficult sections of rock. Ploymus Mountain had no easy path that led to its peak, as some of the other hills and mountains in Hyrule had. This was a mountain firmly in Zora territory, with several waterfalls that fed much of the river. Simply put, one did not need a path when you could swim up a waterfall. Link was an excellent climber in his own right, but slick rocks next to waterfalls were never particularly easy, even without the rain. Still, though, he wished she hadn't followed him. Didn't she understand that this was his duty? He had been chosen as the protector of the land, the hero, the champion. If not his duty, then whose could it be? Still, his friend followed him. He gave a small nod in response to her question and then turned, looking towards the much shallower incline that led up to the peak. He began to walk again, and heard Mipha fall in behind him. He expected that she would hang back. The Lionel was known to have shock arrows, and Mipha didn't have the resilience that her teacher, Sagan, had, and even he had been unable to defeat the Lionel, forced to leap off Shatterback Point into the eastern reservoir to avoid death. This Lionel, it would seem, was a particularly vicious one. This worried Link. While he had never actually spoken with a Lionel, they were not known to speak Hyrulean. He knew them to be intelligent creatures. They were territorial, to be sure, but also fair. If someone ended up in their territory by accident, they would usually give warning, and only attack when that warning was ignored. Not so with this one, based on what Link had been told. Shatterback Point, the peak of Ploymus Mountain, was preceded by a fairly flat, lush patch of land, situated just beneath the peak. It was a favorite spot among Zora, both for recreation and romantic rendezvous. At least that's what some of the Zora had told him. Grass covered the small plateau, and a copse of trees grew near the peak. There was a path that circled around the mountain, up to the northeastern side of the flat expanse, which is the path that they took. As they approached the top, he crouched, looking through the tall blades of grass for any sign of his quarry. He saw no immediate sign of the Lionel, and thought that maybe it had hidden among the trees on the opposite end of the plateau. So, what is our plan? How should I help? Mipha asked behind him. What? Link whirled around, frowning down at her. It's not safe for you. It's not safe for you either, Link. I'll be fine on my own. You need to turn back, Mipha, he said, his voice firm. I am more than capable of assisting you. I'm not... Link sighed, rubbing his forehead. I'm not saying that you aren't capable. It's just... This is my du- An ear-shattering roar silenced both of them, and he whirled, reaching back and unsheathing the legendary blade in one smooth motion. Link! He heard a long, sustained roar. His body grew tense, preparing for a fight. He tried to grip his sword hilt tightly, 
only to find that it wasn't in his hand. Why isn't it? A waterfall. That was the source of the roar. A waterfall. Not a towering creature made of muscle and terror. And he wasn't at the peak of Ploymus Mountain. He was near the base. How had he... Link gasped sharply, stumbling back, eyes widening, as he stared at Sedan's worried expression. That expression was mirrored on Cass's face, standing directly behind him. Rain poured all around them, causing Link's hair to hang limply on his head. Some water dripped down into his eyes and he blinked it away. Link, what happened? Are you all right? Sedan said, taking a step toward him. You froze. We were speaking about the mountain, and then you just stopped moving. Link looked between them, opening his lips to speak, but found his mouth dry, despite the amount of moisture in the air. How could he describe what he'd just experienced? It was a memory, of that he was certain. A memory of Sedan's sister. He tried to wrap his mind around it, to parse through everything that he had witnessed. How long had they been standing there? It was difficult to tell time due to the presence of the dark clouds overhead. Link? Link finally focused on Sedan and tried to clear his throat, nodding. I'm all right, he said, his voice a croak. He swallowed and tried to speak again. I just witnessed something. I saw... Your sister. My sister? Sedan said alarmed. In a memory, Link continued. We were going to fight the Lionel. She went with me. I tried to tell her to go back. But then it ambushed us while we were arguing. I don't... Incredible, Cass said, looking excited. Of course. That's not how the story is told today. In fact, some of the recent versions of it that I've heard don't even mention your presence. But one should always expect some embellishment in such heroic tales. Link met Sedan's eyes, unsure of how the tall Zora would react. Finally, though, Sedan's face broke into a grin, and he reached out, placing a hand on Link's shoulder. That's wonderful, Link. I should not be surprised that thoughts of Mipha cause you to remember some things. You both were so close, from what I have been told. Did you remember anything else? No, just... It was so clear. I was there. I remember my thoughts, my feelings. He thought on how he'd regarded Mipha in the brief memory. She had been his friend, a true friend. His heart suddenly ached for that loss, even though he'd only recovered very little. Already the vision was fading some, like memories did over time. But they had been friends. Of that he was certain. It makes sense, of course. Cass stepped up beside Sedan. We are retreading your steps. I would imagine that you took this very same route to defeat the Lionel 100 years ago. And here you are again. It is amazing how history has a tendency to repeat itself. Yes, it is, Sedan said thoughtful. I imagine that you will have many songs to write after this day. Oh, I am sure that I may be able to come up with a couple, Cass said, smiling. Link finally forced himself to relax. It had been a memory. Not a fragment, not a glimpse of a face or a scent. A true memory. As though he'd been there only moments before. As if Mipha had been alive only moments before. That hurt. He was surprised at how much that thought hurt. He still didn't know her, not truly. He knew only the thoughts and the feelings he'd felt in those few moments. And those had mostly been directed towards the upcoming fight. But it was something. Well, shall we continue? Sedan said, rousing him from his contemplation. He met the Zora's eyes and nodded. Sedan grinned and stretched his arms behind his back before approaching the body of water at the base of the waterfall. Mikhail Lake, Sedan had called it. He'd been telling them about the mountain when Link's memory had been triggered. He'd just finished telling him of the mountain's popularity among the young Zora couples. Sedan slung his bow over his shoulders and leaped into the air before arcing into a perfect dive. He entered the water with barely a splash, but a moment later, he burst out of it and into the rushing waterfall. Amazed, Link watched as he kicked with his legs with blurring speed, using his arms to steer his way up the heavy current. 
The Zora rose far faster than Link would have thought possible, leaping up through the waterfall like a salmon swimming up river rapids. When he reached the top of the waterfall, he burst out into the air, spinning in a lazy circle before falling back out of view. Link glanced over at Cass, who also looked up with fascination. He knew he had to ask, and hoped that the question would not somehow be offensive. Can't you just fly up? He asked. Cass was, as far as he could tell, waiting for Sedan to throw the rope down as well. Lorito looked at him and smiled. Yes and no. You see, we Rito are not actually that proficient at difficult flight. We can fly, but prefer there to be a good updraft for extended flights. Our bones are far denser than that of common birds, and flying straight up is exceedingly difficult. It would take me a long time to gain enough proper altitude in fairer weather. So in the case of climbing this mountain with you gentlemen, I will be as flightless as you. However, if I were to take off from the peak, and if it were not raining so heavily, I could likely fly halfway across Hyrule before needing to rest, assuming I planned my flight accordingly. I didn't know that. I just assumed. Cass chuckled and shook his head. It's quite alright. It is a very normal misconception of our species, and some are better at flight than others. My wife, for example, is a beautiful flyer. She is like a dancer in the air. Compared to her, I am perhaps more aptly described as a stone with wings. Link couldn't help but laugh at this, feeling his spirits lifted. He found that he was happy that Cass had come on this trip. Though the Rito knew too much about the past for his comfort, he was also someone that Link enjoyed being around, even in the short time they'd known each other. Does your wife travel with you? Link said. Oh no, Cass said, his expression growing distant. He looked toward the west. My wife and daughters remain behind in Ritu Village. My daughters are just too young to travel by flight yet, and it is too dangerous to travel by road. My hope is to finish my master's song and make my way back there soon. I feel I have already been gone too long as it is. Link looked at him, able to see the sadness in Cass's eyes, and opened his mouth to speak, though he was unsure of what to say. At that moment, though, a length of rope dropped down from the edge above, and Sedan's head popped into view. Hello down there, he said, waving. Climb up. Cass looked at Link with a smile, and then motioned with a feathered hand that he should be first. Link obliged, stepping forward and grasping the rope. It was slick from the rain, but he was able to grip it well enough. Carefully, he began to pull himself up, using the cliffside for footholds. He was able to pick out the requisite footholds without much difficulty, making the climb surprisingly easy for him. In only a few short minutes, he had scaled the wall and looked back down at Cass. Cass, for his part, climbed the wall without many problems either. The fingers at the end of his wings gripped the rope well, and he used the talons on his feet for added purchase against the cliff. When both Cass and Link had climbed the wall, Sedan pulled the rope back up, wrapping it around his shoulder and waist before smiling at them. That worked magnificently, he said, winking, before walking back over to the pool of water at the top of this cliff. The ledge they stood on was at the bottom of another waterfall, which Sedan immediately set about swimming up. Link wondered just how many walls they would have to scale before reaching the peak. He did not think this was the cliff from his memory, so he assumed there would be at least one more after this. The rain ultimately was their worst enemy on the climb up the mountain. There were only three waterfalls along the path they took towards Poimus Mountain. The first two passed with little incident, but Link's hand slipped on the rope while climbing up alongside the third waterfall, the same one from his memory. Fortunately, he had not been too high up when he fell. Unfortunately, the equipment strapped to his back was still quite painful to fall on. He gasped for breath, rolling onto his stomach. After he caught his breath for a few moments, he groaned and sat up on his knees. Cass crouched next to him, peering at him in concern. Link shook his head, closing his eyes tightly, and reaching around to rub the spot on his back that the sword's scabbard had pressed against. Is he all right? Sedan called down from the top of the cliff. Link's eyes widened, and he whirled, motioning for the Zora to keep quiet. He thought that they still might be far enough away, considering the rain, but if the Lionel heard him. 
The thought of Sedan facing the Lionel alone ultimately helped Link push through the pain in his back and stand. Gritting his teeth, he gripped the rope again and began to climb, one hand over the other, feet finding the small ledges and holes to help propel him higher. He almost slipped again. His hands ached after climbing so much, and the rain had only grown colder the higher they went. But he gripped the rope fiercely, knuckles turning white. Finally, a red-scaled Zora hand gripped his wrist and helped pull him up. He thought back to the events of 100 years ago, when he'd been in this exact situation with Sidon's sister. Perhaps Cass was right about time repeating itself. That, however, did not seem to bode well for his ultimate goals. Cass wisely tied the end of the rope around his waist and climbed up without nearly as much difficulty as Link had. For all their feathery appearance, Rito hands were strong, it would seem. The three of them looked around to each other, expressions growing grim. This was it, then. They still had to walk before they reached the peak, but realistically, the lino could appear at any given moment. No more laughing. No more stories. Either they would be victorious, or they would perish. It was a sobering thought. Together, the three turned and continued their journey up the mountain. He couldn't remember how he defeated the Lionel in the past. At the moment, that seemed to be the real tragedy of the memory he'd seen. He had reached the crest of the same hill from Link's memory, and he knew what to expect as he crouched low and peered through the tall grass. This was a problem because knowing what to expect didn't mean that he knew how to deal with it. Walking tall in the center of the plain was the Lionel. Unfortunately, it looked much like the one in his memory had, if not perhaps a little bigger. It had the body of a large horse, with the torso of a very muscular man, and the head of a red-maned lion. Dark gray fur covered most of its body, with the exception of a few red patches on its hands and arms, its tail, and the mane. A pair of its curved horns sprouted from its forehead. Its body was also scarred in multiple places. Patches of white skin where the fur did not grow were visible all over its torso, flanks, and arms. Roughly hewn leather armor covered parts of its body, its chest and flanks, and its long mane had been tied up behind its head and its tail. Strapped to its sides were its weapons, a wide sword that looked half again as long as Link's sword with a flared tip, a shield with sharpened edges, a bow made of both wood and metal, and a quiver of arrows. It turned towards him, and Link's breath caught as he tried to flatten himself against the ground. He could just barely make out the top of the Lionel's head over the grass. He waited. A moment later, the Lionel turned, walking further away. Exhaling slowly, Link edged his way back down the hill until he could safely stand and slink back around to where Sedan and Cass crouched, waiting. When he reached them, the three of them drew close, speaking in hushed tones, even if the rain ensured they would not be heard. It's there, he said, his expression grim. What is he doing? Sidon glanced up toward the peak. He didn't look nearly so cheerful anymore. Just walking around. It looks alert. It knows that it has been a while since it has been challenged. Most likely, it expects to be attacked by a larger force than before. Sidon paused. Did it still have its arrows? I think so. It had a quiver of arrows. Those will be them, then, Sidon grimaced, looking at Link. I think we should stick with our original plan. If you could keep it occupied up close, I can weaken it with arrows. Are you a good shot? Link said, suddenly dubious about this plan. It had seemed solid at first, but now that he thought about it, that would also put him in the line of fire. Sidon grinned. I am. Link looked at Cass. Eyebrows raised. The Rito had been quiet while he and Sidon discussed their battle plans. I will stay away from the fighting if I can. Perhaps take up a place of observation on the peak. I believe that I can fly around the mountain to that point without being seen. Cass's voice was tense. Clearly he was as anxious about the fight as Link and Sidon were. Link nodded, looking back to Sidon. The prince had perhaps the most dangerous job, something Link was not pleased about. 
Zidane would unleash the opening volley towards the Lionel, drawing its attention in order to allow Link to close the distance without being shot by a shock arrow. In doing so, he put himself at risk by being shot by such an arrow. Link would have to move very quickly indeed. Zidane nodded at him in turn, pulling his Zora bow from around his shoulders. He still held his spear in his other hand. This was it. Link slowly unsheathed his sword and strapped his shield to his arm, however little good it would do against such a beast. Good luck, Cass said, placing a feathered hand on each of their shoulders. He would wait for them to engage the beast before making his own move. Once again, Link wondered at the wisdom of bringing him along. Was it truly wise to bring along a non-combatant to such a dangerous situation? It did not matter, he supposed, as long as he kept his distance. Sidon and Link began up the hill, splitting off from each other when they reached the top. Sidon, nearly crawling on his belly, went right, while Link angled left, ducking behind a large rocky outcropping. If all went well, Sidon would shoot his arrow to get the Lionel's attention, and Link would charge the beast. By timing their two attacks well, they could cause the Lionel to freeze and hopefully end its life before it could properly retaliate. It was a good plan. It had a good chance of... The Lionel roared, and Link heard the sudden crackling sound of a shock arrow being drawn. Cursing, he rushed around the outcropping to see the Lionel drawing upon Sidon, who hadn't even had a chance to draw an arrow yet. Hey! Link cried, banging his sword against his shield. It had the desired effect, for better or ill. The Lionel turned its aim towards Link and loosed the shock arrow. He caught a glimpse of the yellow arrow flying through the air, and just managed to avoid being struck in the chest by it by rolling forward. He heard the snap of a bowstring. He looked up just in time to see Sidon's arrow sink into the Lionel's shoulder. The Lionel roared in anger, turning again towards Sidon, drawing another arrow. Link leaped to his feet, sprinting forward, shield out in front, yelling a battle cry to get the Lionel's attention again. The Lionel this time ignored Link and shot the arrow at Sidon, who dove out of the way just in time. He sprinted forward, drawing his sword back hoping to plunge the blade into the Lionel and end the fight there. The Lionel looked at him, its flat nose flaring, and swung its bow at Link like a two-handed bludgeon. The bow slammed into Link's shield like a boulder, and he felt his feet leave the ground as he was thrown several feet to the side before landing in a painful heap. Dazed, with his right arm aching painfully from taking the brunt of the blow, Link lay still for a moment. He felt rather than heard the Lionel's hooves pounding the ground a moment later. Eyes widening, Link tucked his arms to his body, rolling to the side. The Lionel charged past, one of its enormous hooves coming within inches of crushing Link's body under its mass. Sidon shot another arrow at the Lionel, this one sinking into its flank. Once again, this had the effect of enraging the Lionel, but did not seem to slow it. The Lionel roared again, eyes widening in fury and it pulled a pair of shock arrows from its quiver. It placed both of them on its large bow and drew taking aim at Sidon's exposed position. Why hadn't he taken better cover? No! Link yelled, as the Lionel released its arrows. They both flew at a slight angle, neither aimed directly at Sidon. He seemed to notice this, and froze as both arrows struck the ground on either side of him. This, it would seem, was the Lionel's intent, however, and Link watched in horror as lightning arced across the wet rock Sidon was standing on. Sidon screamed in pain as electricity ran up his body, dropping his bow and falling to the ground, body overcome by spasms. The Zora Prince did not rise, and Link feared the worst. Gripping his sword in a white-knuckled grip, Link pushed himself to his feet and ran at the Lionel. The Lionel turned towards him and swung its bow again. Link anticipated this move and ducked low while thrusting his sword up. He did not succeed in running the Lionel through, as he had hoped but did manage to give the Lionel a shallow cut just above its front leg's shoulder. The Lionel reared back on its hind quarters, and he rolled to the side avoiding its kick. When the hooves came down, the ground shook. The Lionel was far larger than he thought, now that he was up close. His head barely reached its torso. How had he ever defeated this beast before? He stood, still gripping his sword and shield and met the Lionel's eyes. They were a shocking green. For a moment, the two of them stood still, eyes locked, warrior to warrior. 
The Lionel strapped its bow to its waist and pulled its sword and shield free. Link exhaled slowly and chanced a quick glance over at Sidon. He still had not moved. Was he even still alive? The Lionel roared its challenge and charged at Link, drawing its sword arm back to cut him in two. He waited until the last moment before leaping to the side, avoiding both the crushing hooves and the wicked blade's arc. The Lionel kept charging ahead, coming back around in a large arc, while Link waited. The Lionel turned and charged again, expression one of fury. The creature was large and powerful, with long arms and a clear height advantage, but Link had the advantage of being far nimbler. As the Lionel passed by this time, he scored a shallow cut on its rear hip. The Lionel swung its sword back, but he was already comfortably out of range. Angry, the Lionel looped back around, nostrils flared. It didn't charge again, but approached more cautiously. It began to swing its sword this way and that, forcing Link back, but never managing to find its target. He dodged and spun out of the way of each attack. He was beginning to feel more comfortable fighting the beast. Though his mind did not remember fighting the Lionel on Ployamus Mountain before, his muscles seemed to. He needed to remain light on his feet, make it angry, make it sloppy. He began to grow exhilarated, heart racing as instincts took over. His fear evaporated, replaced by certainty. In his mind's eye, he could see how this battle would end. The Lionel swung, and Link moved just out of reach, before darting back and scoring a shallow gash on the creature's forearm. The Lionel brought its shield around to slam into Link's head, but he dodged, parrying the shield aside with his own. Yes, he could fight this beast. Link began to dance around the Lionel, always in motion. While it was difficult to deal with anything but superficial damage, he knew it was only a matter of time. The Lionel was getting angrier. It turned again, to face him, and thrust its sword toward Link's heart. He moved to the side, and using his shield to slam the Lionel's blade down into the ground. Spinning, Link swung his sword in a wide arc that swung just underneath the Lionel's ready shield, cutting deep into its front leg. The Lionel reared, roaring in pain, and he sprinted forward just under the kicking legs, well past the Lionel's guard. He thrust his sword into the Lionel's flank, which caused its whole body to spasm. The Lionel backed away from Link, placing a large hand on its side to staunch the flow of blood. It seemed surprised by the wound, looking down at its side. Then it roared in fury, jumping back with a shockingly powerful leap. It landed perhaps a dozen feet back, and Link prepared for another charge. The Lionel, however, did not charge. Instead, it took a deep breath, expanding its chest with air. What is it? It breathed fire. The Lionel breathed fire. Or, more accurately, as he noted as he rolled to the side, the Lionel breathed a massive ball of fire. He felt the heat of it as it passed by, burning the wet grass in its path to black ash. The Lionel took another breath, and Link's eyes widened. He got to his feet and began to sprint in a wide semicircle, the fireballs passing just behind him. He was so focused on escaping the blast of fire that he almost didn't hear the hooves pounding the earth again. He turned his head just in time to see the Lionel bearing down on him. It no longer had its weapons in its hands, but loped forward on all six of its limbs, using its powerful arms to propel itself forward. Its head was down, those wicked horns pointed right at Link's torso. Link got his shield up just in time, and rather than being trampled or gored by horns, he was knocked to the side like a ragdoll. He hit the ground in a painful roll. When he came up, his left hand was empty. The sword had been knocked free of his grasp. He looked around wide-eyed, but it was lost among the tall grass of the clearing. The Lionel had already turned, its sword and shield free again, and it came at him, murder in its green eyes. He jumped back, avoiding the first cut, and then leaped to the side, narrowly missing the second. He had no weapons. He had the Sheikah Slate, true, but hardly had any time to pull it free and navigate its menus. Stasis could be useful but he was certain that he would be dead long before he could pull it free and select the Lionel as its target. The Lionel bore down on him, relentless. He deflected one attack with his shield, knocking the Lionel's sword aside from striking his body. The cost was a painful wrench of his shoulder. He could not keep doing that without dislocating or breaking something. The Lionel swung both his sword and shield at him in tandem, and he did a backflip, the two bladed weapons passing just under his feet. 
He landed several feet back. This move seemed to surprise the Lionel, which eyed him with narrowed eyes. The surprise did not last long, however, and it approached again, towering over him. With a shock, Link realized that his back was up against a rock outcropping. The Lionel seemed to realize it as well, as a smile split its feline mouth, revealing a set of four vicious-looking fangs. It positions its shield to the side, ready to catch Link if it dodged that way, and raised its sword to end him. An arrow suddenly sprouted from the Lionel's shield arm. The Lionel roared in pain and confusion, and he bolted, ducking under the shield. The Lionel brought the bladed shield down a moment too late, allowing him the chance to escape. Sedan, in the grass not far away, lowered his bow and bent down. Link! He cried as he stood and threw something at Link. The object arced through the air and Link caught it. Sedan's silvery spear glittered in his hand. Its point was shaped almost like a fish's tail, with a pair of curved points and a sharp edge between them, providing both a pointed edge to stab and a bladed edge to slice. The Lionel charged at Link's exposed back. He could hear its roar and felt the ground tremble under its hooves. Sedan's eyes widened. Link spun. He placed the button under the spear into the ground and angled the point up. The Lionel saw its mistake a split second too late, and the spear's point, shining despite the dim overcast light of the day, pierced the center of its chest, right underneath its ribcage. This, Link was surprised to find, did not quite kill it. Even though the spear had pierced where he expected the Lionel's heart would be, it still swung its sword at him. He jumped back, barely avoiding being cleaved in half. The Lionel stood up straight, the spear still impaling its chest. With a shock, Link saw that the spear had actually been rammed all the way through. The point jetted out from the Lionel's back. It roared, but it was more of a guttural sound than before. Blood dripped from its red mane below its mouth. It took a step toward Link, but its movements had grown sluggish. Its legs trembled, and its shield arm hung limply by its side. Still, though, it tried to take another swing at Link, desperately, angrily, trying to kill him before it too died. Another arrow flew through the air, lodging deeply in its side. The Lionel flinched, but it kept towards him, and he again weaponless gave ground. His foot landed on something other than grass and dirt, and he looked down, spotting, not his sword, but another Zora spear, perhaps left over from one of the other Zora that had challenged the beast. He picked it up, surprised to find that its metal shaft had been broken in two. It was barely longer than a sword now. It would do. The Lionel swung its sword at him again, bloody teeth bared in a snarl. He used the broken spear to knock the sword aside. The Lionel's swings lacked the power it had before, and he lunged forward, driving the spear point into the Lionel's gut. He pulled it free, and stabbed again at one of the Lionel's front legs. The Lionel's front legs gave out, and it fell to its knees groaning. Another two new arrows sprouted from the Lionel's flank and back. He stepped back, watching the now motionless Lionel as it knelt. Both of its arms hung limply by its sides now, and it bled from a dozen different wounds all over its body. It turned its lion head to look at Link, and he saw rage in its green eyes. It tried to roar again, but the only sound it could make was a bloody gurgle. Sedan released another arrow, and this one lodged into the side of the Lionel's head. Link watched, grimacing, as the Lionel's eyes glazed over. Its mouth hung slack, and torso slumped forward, held up by Sedan's sphere. Sedan remained silent as he approached to stand beside Link and surveyed their gruesome victory. After a few moments, Sedan placed a hand on Link's shoulder, squeezing it. Thank you, he said, his voice strained. You've done, Zora, me, a great service this day, Link. Link nodded, silently, lips drawn into a thin line. Memories flashed through his head. Another Lionel just like this, though smaller, younger. Dancing around its flashing blade, it hadn't had a shield, and making multiple cuts with his sword. Mifa had helped too, using her trident to stab with unerring accuracy. Link had been the one to deliver the final blow then, swinging his sword in a powerful spin that severed limbs. He hadn't felt particularly victorious on that day either. 
Another person approached. Cass, walking through the grass and holding Link's fallen sword. He must have seen where the sword had landed from his vantage point. Link mutely took the sword and sheathed it. He placed his shield on his back as well, taking a deep breath and leaning it out slowly. He was a warrior. A killer. But he had also defeated a beast. A terror that killed many Zora. He could, he would, take solace in that fact. After a time, Sidon finally looked down at him and smiled. Come, he said. Let us go to the peak. You can see the Varuta from there, and we can plan our next steps. Link nodded before walking to the Lionel and removing the quiver of arrows from its waist. He pulled one of the arrows out, satisfied to see its yellow tip. Shock arrows. The Divine Beast. There was another reason for this battle today. Divine Beast Varuta stood far below Shatterback Point. It stood in the midst of the East Reservoir Lake far below, created by Zora generations ago when they made the dam that prevented the flooding of Hyrule in times of heavy rain. Of course, no one expected at that time that they would ever experience heavy rain like this. Ruta was distant enough that it was difficult for Link to make out fine details, but he could see its large shape in the water. It looked much like it had in the mural on Impa's wall. Vaguely elephant-shaped, with a stocky body, four thick legs and a long trunk. The trunk was currently pointing to the heavens, and from it, mist and water sprayed. The mist rose into the air, spiraling about itself until it reached the clouds overhead, which were much closer at this altitude. This was how Ruta was creating the rain then. Incredible, Cass said from behind him. Link wondered if he could see the Divine Beast better than he could with his avian eyes. Sedan remained silent. He gazed down at Ruta, his expression difficult to read. Link thought he saw sorrow there, but it was fleeting. Finally, after a time, Sedan looked at Link and then nodded to the distant black wall that made up the dam. I think we should approach from the front. Based on our experiences, Ruta does not feel the need to defend herself until someone enters the waters, Sedan said, pointing. So, we'll use the dam to climb up the reservoir. From there, you shall use your shark arrows on key points on Ruta's body. This should disable her long enough to get on board. From there, he trailed off, likely thinking the same thing Link was. Neither of them knew what to expect once aboard Ruta. Link nodded slowly. It should work, he said, though he lacked any real certainty. Oh, I'm confident it will, Sidon said, suddenly grinning. Link looked at the prince, eyebrows raised in question. Link after today, I am nothing but confident in your abilities to be victorious over anything you face. I can't beat everything, Link thought as he forced a smile onto his lips. That much has been proven. The three looked down at the divine beast Varuta for a time longer. Far below them, it made a loud trumpeting sound, and a few moments later, the rain seemed to come down even harder. Sidon cleared his throat and stepped back from the precipice, looking at each of them in turn. Well, shall we? Link and Cass both turned from the Divine Beast, and together, they began to make their way back down Ploymus Mountain.